We are starting a new series here at Cross Connection called Identity. We're considering from the scriptures out of the book of Ephesians who we are, who we were, who we will be, and who we should be in Christ, and how God has enabled us to do that. So open your Bibles with us to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll jump right into the discussion of who we are in Christ. The Greeks had a saying, Gnothai Seauton. Translated for us, it means know thyself. It was considered by the Greeks to be one of their celebrated maxims. Pausinius, who lived during the second century AD, he was a Greek geographer and also a traveler who kind of wrote a traveler's guide to ancient Greece. And in his guide in the 10th book on discovering Greece, he talks about how in the city of Delphi, there at the temple of Apollo, that maxim was inscribed on one of the stones in the forecourt as you'd come in. Gnothai seauton, know thyself. It was traced all the way back to the 6th century BC and the seven sages of Greece, the kind of founding fathers of the nation of Greece who were these Stoic philosophers. And they came up with about 147 or so sayings, sayings that they meant to give for the help of men's life. But among the celebrated maxims, that was number one, know thyself. The interesting thing is, is that during that time in ancient Greece, it was meant to instill a mindset of humility. That was the point, that in knowing yourself and comprehending your limitations and your shortcomings and your weaknesses, if you knew yourself, you'd have a better ability to be able to relate to people with a humble nature, with humility. Now, in our day, the idea of knowing oneself doesn't have the same underlying bent. As you move out thousands of years from the origination of that in the 6th century BC to the 21st century today, humility is not the aim or the focus of self-discovery. Self-discovery for most people in Western culture today, even though our culture is built on that framework of the Greek culture of thousands of years ago, even though it's built on that today, self-discovery is for the, the intent purpose of self-expression and showing people how great you are. So humility is not the bent. In 21st century American culture, that idea of know thyself can be probably summed up by one of the lyrics from the hit song, Let It Go, from Frozen. You guys remember that song? All the kids in the children's ministry, they know that song, Let It Go. There's a line in that song, it goes like this. It's time to see what I can do, to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. Now, it's interesting when you, you look at the hit songs of the day because philosophies and ideas are always promoted through pop culture, especially through music. And so when you kind of deconstruct and break apart the songs that are playing on the hit stations, the hit radio stations in our community, you see what is the bent, what is the mindset, what is the framework, the philosophy, the worldview that's being put forth from this. And it's just kind of interesting when you think about that. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go, right? And we live in a culture today where that's the, that's the orientation of self-discovery of knowing yourself so that you can let it go and let the world see, so that you can show off just who you are. In our day, people will say things, and, and perhaps you even remember a time in your life where you thought or said things like this, I've got to figure out who I am. I've got to figure out who I am. Now, I'll admit there's a certain extent to which that's not a bad thing. If the aim is to discover your limitations and your, your inabilities so that you can uh, fill up what is lacking and work on areas of weakness. Every single one of us have areas of weakness. But most people in our culture today, when they're moving towards the, the goal of self-discovery, it's so that they can accentuate all the positive and just, just kind of hide the negative. Let's not, let's not talk about our weaknesses. But the reality is, is that we should, to a certain extent, measure our abilities and see and have a proper understanding of who we are. You know, that idea of expressing humility and know thyself, it's very similar to what the Apostle Paul would write in Galatians chapter 6. It's just one chapter to the left of Ephesians where we're going to be in a moment. But in Galatians chapter 6 verse 3, he says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. 
If anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And I'm willing to bet that every single one of us, especially us guys, there have been times in our lives where we thought we could handle something. We thought that we could do it, and it turned out we couldn't. Some of you guys still have back pain from, from one of those decisions <laughs> at a certain time in your life where you thought you could do it, and you realized very quickly that the strength you thought you had was actually weakness. And so know thyself is similar to Paul's bent there. But in our culture, it's for the purpose of self-discovery and self-expression. Now, Socrates, again, a Stoic philosopher of the 5th century BC among the Greeks, he made the statement, or he's known for making this statement among many others, the unexamined life is not worth living. And there is an aspect where we should consider who we are. But our consideration of who we are should always be, as we're going to consider as we go through this text today and over the next several weeks as we go through the book of Ephesians, should, as a Christian, always be in respect to who God is, that we consider who we are in relationship to who he is. Now, if your self-discovery and examination of yourself is in relation to other people, you're always going to one-up them, right? Because you're always going to look for people that aren't as strong as you, or aren't as smart as you, or aren't as good as looking as you, or aren't as funny as you. And then you're going to establish that as the, the common denominator. You know, I'm so much better than they. But if you flip it around and you realize, no, the one that we are setting ourselves up next to is Christ, well, then it puts us in a proper place, as we'll see as we go through that. But today, when people are, are moving towards this kind of self-realization sort of mindset and trying to figure out who they are, I've got to figure out who I am, they tend to come up with things that have nothing to do with humility. They tend to come up with new maxims, new sayings, things like, I can do anything if I put my mind to it, or, or I've got to live life on my own terms, some people will say. Or you'll hear people say, I've just got to be me. These are all like fully tweetable too, you know I mean? It's, it's under 140 characters, so people kind of post these things and then other people retweet it. If you know nothing about that, that's fine. But they just go, oh, I like it, I like it, I like it. When people say things like, I've got to look out for me. I've got to depend on me, no one else. That's the, that's the orientation of our culture in 21st century America. It's not new, but it's something that is definitely increased, and the flames of that are, are blown upon constantly. And if those are the outcomes of self-discovery, then I would say that your, your measuring rod is the wrong one. You're establishing who you are on the basis of the wrong thing. You're discovering your identity, which is the, the series that we're doing right now, in, in the wrong terms, with the wrong lens. And we live in a society and in a time where people want to figure things out on their own, and then as a result, they want to craft for themselves their own worldview, their own personal philosophy. And we know this is the case because when we interact with people today who don't go to church or don't know Jesus, and we talk with them about religious things, and we don't really talk about religious things in our day, people don't like to call themselves religious, they'll say they're spiritual. And when you start to kind of push on that button a little bit and discover, well, what do you mean by I'm spiritual, then you come up with all these different ideas and worldviews and philosophies, and as you're talking with someone, they share with you their individual philosophy. You go, well, that's interesting because I believe this. And they go, I'm glad you have that, mm -hmm. right? Yep. You, you have your truth, and I have my truth. And most people's basis of truth is upon their own experience of life or their own self-discovery. It has no firm foundation other than what they've experienced, which is not a good idea if you have gone down that path. You know that to be the case. But there are people that have their own worldview, their own individual philosophy. And for a worldview or a philosophy to stand up, to you know, be worth their salt, then they need to answer some pretty basic questions. If you would, look at your sermon guide. Point number one four philosophical questions that a worldview needs to try to answer in some sort of satisfactory way. Letter A is the question of identity. Who am I? Any philosophy worth its salt needs to go towards the answer of that question. Who am I? My identity. Letter B, origin. Where did I come from? Where did I come from? Letter C, destiny. Where am I going? And letter D, purpose. Why am I here? And when you start to ask questions of people, 
when you break below the surface of just, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm good. And oh, you got nice grass in your yard or whatever it may be as you're going to get the mail and you're talking to your neighbor, whatever it is, as you break below the surface and you start to talk with people and everybody has their own worldview and everybody has their own philosophy. And some of those are deeply ingrained in scripture, but many of those today are not. They may have a few verses that they've pulled from some sort of book that has some pithy sayings in it that like loosely draws on scripture, but they have some sort of philosophy that kind of the thing that they build their life upon. And it should, in some way, answer these questions. What's their identity? What's their origin? What's their destiny? What's their purpose? Why are they here? What is the meaning of life? And everybody has some answer for that question. And if it's going to be a philosophy that's worth anything that other people should hang on to, then it should answer these questions in a coherent sort of manner. And in this series, over the next six weeks, my aim is to consider these questions from a biblical point of view using the book of Ephesians. To look at what God would say in his inspired word through the Apostle Paul, through this six-chapter letter that was written 2,000 years ago. What would it be that God would be ministering and answering these questions? Now, why would we look at the scripture for this? Because it is my conviction that the Bible presents the most compelling and coherent philosophy. It presents the most compelling and coherent philosophy and worldview on life. In other words, the Bible has better answers to these questions than Muhammad. The Bible has better answers to these questions than Buddha or Confucius, than the Quran or the Upanishads or the Vedas. It has better answers than Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking and Richard Dawkins. So that's my presupposition, if you will. That's my foundation, that the scriptures have better answers that are more compelling and more coherent than what is being given to us by our friends, coworkers, neighbors, or by the culture that we live in today. Because our culture is always espousing a, a philosophy. It's always espousing a worldview. Whether it's the nightly news that editorializes what's happening in the world in a certain framework and says, this is what this means that just happened in France. This is what this means. And they're, they're trying to show you what their view on that is. Why is that? You know, every time there's an event like what just happened this last week in France, and you get on the news, they're not just reporting. They're telling you, why did this happen? What, what was it? Extremism? Was it religion? Was it this? Was it that? Was it the culture that allowed those sort of things? So every time you turn on the news, you're getting some sort of idea about what their mental framework is, their worldview is on the world, not just on the news. But when you turn on the radio, if you listen, whether you listen to country music, now there's some funny philosophies in country music, let me tell you. If you deconstruct the songs, if you just listen to the lyrics, because every one of these songs tells some sort of story, even if it's sparsely there, it's some sort of story. And so if you're listening to Maroon 5 or you're listening to Taylor Swift, you know, whatever it may be, I don't know what you listen to throughout the week. God bless you. Uh, or even if you're listening to a Christian artist, if you're listening to Matt Redman or Brenton Brown, there's a philosophy that's there. And the interesting thing is, is a lot of times we don't, we don't recognize this, but the more we listen to it, the more we put it into our mind, it changes our philosophy. That's why it's important to be repetitively putting in the word of God into your heart and your mind. Why? That will change your philosophy. Amen. And I encourage you, if you started this year reading through the scriptures, keep doing it. If you haven't started yet, it's still early. Start doing it. Go through the scriptures. Read through the scriptures. And as you do, as you're putting that in, you're going to see your philosophy, your, your worldview will change. You'll begin to see it through a different lens, which is actually a beneficial and good thing. But we are constantly being bombarded with different philosophies. And Paul the Apostle, he, he said, look at this real quick, if you would open your Bibles to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. How many of you have seen that store? I don't even know if it's around anymore. C28. There used to be a store in the mall. It comes from this, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Paul says this, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Why is this important that we're going to do over the next six weeks? Because we don't want to be cheated through someone's empty philosophy. If someone has their own personal worldview, their own individual philosophy that they created by their own construct, by their own experience of life, by their upbringing, by the things that they've read, by the things that they've heard, 
by the thing that their great grandma told them, whatever it may be, however they constructed that philosophy, if it's not founded in Christ, it is vain. It's empty. It answers these questions in an incoherent and non-compelling sort of way. And so he says, don't let anybody cheat you through their empty philosophies. So we've got to be careful as it relates to these things. These things are truly important. And not only are, it, does the Bible present a more coherent and compelling answer to these basic questions of philosophy, of worldviews, the other thing that's important about discovering these things from the scriptures is that when you answer adequately the question of identity, who you are, and origin, where you came from, and destiny, where you're going, it is a lot easier to answer the question of purpose. Why am I here? And you know, I would say that among Christians, that's probably the most common question that people come down to. When you get rid of all the doctrinal and theological things that we cover with, we cover our deep hurts and our deep questions with theological sort of constructs. And we start asking about Calvinism and eschatology and all these sort of things to cover over the things that truly are challenging us. But when you get right down to it, a lot of people's number one question is, what does God want me to do? And it is easier to answer the question of what does God want me to do when you know who you are, where you came from, and where you're going. And so that's why we're going to be looking at these things over the next six weeks. Now, as a caveat or a preface to going through this section of Scripture, we could spend months, probably a year, in the book of Ephesians. We're not going to do that. And many of you have read through it and studied through it on your own, or you've been through a, a teaching on the book of Ephesians that went through verse by verse and chapter by chapter and deconstructed how this Greek word fits with this Greek word and how this connects with this passage. We're not going to do that, and I realize that for some people that's challenging, but there's a reason for it. I believe that Lord, the Lord wants to target a specific thing for us as we're going through the scriptures that has to do with the answers of these questions and what it means in our life as we're starting off a new year. And so if you would, open up to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, When, when you know who you are, you will better be able to understand what it is that you are supposed to do. So before we read from this, point number, one on your, or point number two on your outline, just jot this down, and we'll look at it more in just a second. Point number two, your I am affects your I do. Your I am affects your I do. Now, Ephesians chapter one, stand with me as we normally do. We're going to read the first 14 verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of the truth of the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. God, would you lead us and speak to us and challenge us and transform our thinking 
and transform our lives as we look at this passage of Scripture over the next six weeks, as we consider how this that is revealed from you through the Apostle Paul to your church, how it changes the framework of who we are and where we came from and where we're going and what we are here to do. And Lord, as we grasp our identity in you, would you from that help us to see just what it is that you want us to do? Because our I am, our identity, our position affects what we do and how we live. So God, transform us by the renewing of our minds with our, your living word, which is powerful, and make us more like you, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 You can be seated. Your I am affects your I do. We see that from the opening words of this letter. Paul the Apostle, the founding pastor, the church planter of the church in the city of Ephesus, modern day Turkey. He planted this church on his third missionary journey. That began at the end of his second missionary journey. He kind of stopped there and began to speak into that culture. But then he came back and he spent some two years probably three years actually teaching and ministering there on the, in Asia Minor in the city of Ephesus, and this church was grown. And, and now, almost a decade later, the Apostle Paul has not been back to this church in nearly 10 years, and he's now in a prison in Rome. This is after Paul's journey to Rome at the, at the, end, of his, uh, the end of everything that's explained in the book of Acts, which we studied at the end of last year. Now he's in the city of Rome and he's under house arrest. He's in prison. He can't come and go freely. And so being that he can't go and visit his friends in Ephesus, he writes them a letter, this letter. And he begins by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul understood who he was in Christ. And, and if you followed along with what we just read in those first opening verses, the 14 verses, the words in Christ or in him or in whom are seen repeatedly. There's a theme there. Anytime you see something repeated in the scriptures, you should key in on it and see what is it that God is trying to say through these words that keep being repeated. It's just like when you were little or you had little kids, you tell them, look both ways before you cross the street, look both ways before you cross the street, look both ways before you cross the street. You're trying to get them to have something in their mind by your repetition. And so here, Repetition, he says, in him, in Christ, in whom, constantly. And Paul grasped, he understood who he was in Christ, and that changed everything about his life. That changed his entire life, what he did with his life. Because your I am, your understanding of your identity, it affects your I do. And it's not the other way around. It's not the other way around. Why do I say that? Well, some of you have heard the statement by Rene Descartes, the French philosopher, you didn't know it came from him, but you've probably heard the statement, I think, therefore I, I am. I think, therefore I am. Now, for most men, that's not true. For most men, it's I do, therefore I am. And I know this because anytime you meet, guys meet new guys for the first time and they're getting to know each other, what's one of the first questions that they ask? So what do you do for a living? Right? What do you do? That is the orientation in our culture among men that what we do defines our identity. Our activity defines our identity. And what Jesus wants to do, as we see here in the opening words of the book of Ephesians, and as we're going to consider over the next several weeks, he wants to move that around, that our identity crafts our activity. Most men define themselves by their activity. My activity defines who I am, but Jesus wants that to change. Who we are transforms our activity. And notice it with just the nuance of what Paul says here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. You see, Paul, he came to a discovery about his true identity later in his life. He, he w didn't start life off with an understanding of who he was in Christ. None of us do. We all come to a certain point called conversion by most people in the Christian faith. We come to a certain point of conversion where we discover our true identity. 
And Paul, at a certain point of his life, in his early 30s, we believe, he came to a discovery of his true identity. And everything about his life changed after that point. He gives a minor description of it in the book of Ephesians, which is, you know, helpfully just one book to the right of Ephesians. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Because in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, Paul shows off, if you will, the way that he identified himself before his conversion, before he comprehended his true identity in Jesus, this is how he identified himself. This is what gave him his substance of who I am. In Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 4. He says there, Philippians 3 verse 4, if though also I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. What, what's Paul saying? Well, in verse four there, he's saying, listen, this is what I trusted in, in me, about who I am. And I had a lot to trust in, more so than other people, he's saying. Kind of proud, boastful statement, but that's Paul before Christ. That was his view of himself. I'm better than everybody else. That was his identity. And here's why. This is where he got his identity. Verse five circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Paul's identity had everything to do with his activity. He was a child of Abraham through Isaac, through Israel, Jacob, of the tribe of Benjamin, but more than his heritage, he was a law-following, blameless Pharisee. And his entire identity was bound up in that activity of his life. His heritage just set him on the right trajectory. He just figured, you know, I just got the right start. I got a good start, but this is who I was. I was blameless. I was righteous. I was zealous. I was a Pharisee. That was his identity. But something changed. And if you've been reading through uh, the scriptures this week using the McShane reading plan, which is the plan that I use, then you read through Acts chapter 9 just a couple of days ago. And in Acts chapter 9, you were reacquainted with that conversion experience of the Apostle Paul when that Pharisee who was blameless and righteous and zealous was moving in his zeal to try to kill Christians. He was stopped by Jesus and his identity got completely shut down. He had an identity crisis. He literally had an identity crisis. Everything that he put his stock in was now flatlined. He lost it all in a second. And he's laying on the ground in the dust, thrown down there by the glory of Jesus, kind of cowering, going, who are you? And, and everything changes in his life. And from that point, then there was this discovery of who Jesus is and in the discovery of who Jesus is, it completely changed his understanding of who he was. And then he became a sent one of Jesus. That's what the word apostle means. When we read here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he is a sent one of Jesus. Prior to that conversion experience of coming to know who he was in light of who Christ is, he was set on his own path. He's going to do what he wants. But there at that moment in Acts chapter 9, he says, what do you want me to do, Lord? That's an attitude of submission right there. You are greater than me. I, I've been the greatest until that moment, and now you're greater than me. And now, he says, what do you want me to do? And now he says, I want you to go into the city. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You go sit in there for a few, few days. I'll come in, and I'll talk to you. It's kind of like it, when you had little kids. You say, you go in your room. You did something bad. You go in your room. I'm going to come talk to you in a few minutes. And they're sitting there going, right? That's what he did for three days. And he sat there just mulling over everything he thought about himself and about the world, and it was completely gone. And now Jesus comes and speaks to him and says, you're a chosen vessel of mine to carry the gospel. And everything changed. And so Paul's I am changed. His position, his understanding of who he was changed. And now his I do, his activity completely is altered. Not just Paul, but look at the Ephesians, the very next statement that Paul makes here in Ephesians chapter one. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, not by his own will, not by his own directing. He wasn't the captain of his own ship the master of his destiny, by the will of God. This is what I do. Now, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, do you see the identity and the activity in these words? To the saints' identity who are faithful activity. 
You see the separation there to the saints that are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. You see they, the recipients of this letter that Paul is sending to them, there in the city of Ephesus, they were saints. That was their identity, and their activity was faithfulness to Jesus. Now, many Christians live their entire lives trying to be faithful activity so that they can get the identity of saint, but it's actually the inverse. In Christ, which is what Paul's going to describe here in the following verses, if you're a Christian today, you are a saint. That's your identity. Therefore, because you are a saint, your activity ought to be one of faithfulness. And we turn things around. This is the constant challenge among all Christians. You see, it is our fallen nature to default to religion. And religion is not necessarily a bad thing unless you think that your religious activity makes you what you are. Because I am doing these things, therefore I'm righteous, I'm holy. And most people live their lives like this. It's very hard to break out of it. It's very hard to step into the place where I am a saint, and therefore this is what follows in my life. Most of us try to be faithful and do righteous things and do good to others because then that makes me who I am, and that's not true. That is the default of our flesh. That is the lie of the enemy because he wants to trap people in religious effort to try and be good enough, and you'll never be good enough. You'll never succeed at being good enough. And so you'd be trapped there forever. But he identifies them as saints and their activity. Following that was faithfulness. Since you are a saint, therefore be faithful. Your I am affects your I do. And not the other way around. Point number three on your outline. We must fully embrace our I am in Christ. We must fully embrace our I am in Christ. If you're ever going to live this life in faithfulness to Christ, then you need to fully grasp who you are in Christ. Well, that sounds good, but how? I mean, it's great to make kind of puffed up propositions, like if you're ever going to fully grasp who you are in Christ... You know, people go, oh, yeah, amen, but okay, how? Well, the first thing comes at the end of verse 1 there. I'm sorry, it's actually verse 2 in Ephesians chapter 1. Notice what he says. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that you need to comprehend is that you are what you are, not by your own activity or effort, but by the grace of God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How do they become saints? Not by their activity. Their activity of faithfulness sprang from their identity as saints. How did they become saints? They became saints by the grace of God that came from him. Turn just a few books to the left of Ephesians to 1 Corinthians. You're going to pass Galatians and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 10, Paul is describing here the testimony or the witness of those who saw the risen Jesus. And he says here in 1 Corinthians 15 that he was one of the last ones to have an encounter with the risen Jesus among the apostles. And he says this, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Did you highlight those words or underline them? By the grace of God, I am what I am. That's a drastic change from circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, according to the law, blameless. Drastic change. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Those are words of identity. And his identity sprang not from his effort, not from his activity, but from the grace of God. By the grace of God, I have this identity. Now look what he says. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I, what word? Labored. That's the word of activity. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul's I am, his identity, was by the grace of God, and that grace of God that made him in Christ 
moved him towards his laboring, his working. And so Paul's I do, his laboring, came after the grace of God came to him. And so we must fully embrace our I am, our position, our identity in Christ by his grace. Secondly, we must comprehend that all that we have in Christ is by God's grace. He brought us into this identity, into this position as Christians by his grace, but he's not only brought us in, he's also given us great gain in Christ. And what are the things that we gain in Christ? Point number four on your outline. I have and gain in Christ, that's the first blank there, I have and gain in Christ. And then over the next few minutes, I'm going to take us through the following verses, verses 3 through about verse 11 in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at a number of things that we have and gain in Christ. And there's a few lines there, and you can just jot some things down. I'll kind of hit on them as we go through, but I want you to see these things. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, we already understand that our identity is we are saints, and that affects our activity, but that identity came from the grace of God, not by our activity, And now that we're in Christ, we have a lot of great gain in Christ. What sort of things? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. If you're a Christian today, if your identity is in Christ, then you have at your disposal Every spiritual blessing, not 10%, not 50%, not even 90%. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, of course, the question is, what are spiritual blessings? Well, you got to read the scriptures to find out what they all are, to enumerate them, to list them out. Some of, them things, some of the things are like love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, gentleness, self-control. Those things are spiritual blessings that God has given to us. The Apostle Peter, he says it like this. I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, by God's divine power, he's given to you and to me everything that we need to live this life in a godly manner. Everything that pertains to life and godliness, we have in him. And so here, Paul says that we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. So what do we have and gain in Christ? Everything. He goes on, verse 4. Just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, sanctified, without blame before him in love. He chose us to be these things. We don't have to make ourselves these things on our own. He chose us to be that, and he who started a good work in us will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So in Christ, we gain every spiritual blessing. Not only that, we are chosen. Verse 5, he says, having predestined us, we are the recipients of every spiritual blessing, we are chosen, we are predestined. Predestined to what? Predestined unto adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, according to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It it makes God happy to choose you and bring you into his family. And so you have every spiritual blessing. You've been chosen. You've been predestined. You've been adopted. To the praise of the glory of his grace, verse 6, all of this is by his grace, by which he has made us accepted, Chosen, adopted, predestined, accepted in the beloved, in him. Verse 7, in him we have redemption. He purchased us back. That can go on the list. We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. You're forgiven of all the things that you've done in the past and anything you might do in the future. According to the riches of his grace. It's not by your effort or mine that makes us forgiven. It's by the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He doesn't have like one little like drip of blessing, of grace. Kind of, you're kind of waiting there like, oh, 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 there it comes. Oh, I got it. No, it is abundant. We'll see this again in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 in a few weeks. And so he made it to abound to us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. What does it mean that he made known to us the mystery of his will? One of the other things we have and gain in Christ is revelation of what he wants us to do. We have revelation of his will. He goes on, That in the dispensation, verse 10, of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. 
One of the other things that we have in him is that he's going to gather us to himself. We will be with him forever. That's in the future. We're not trying to win a spot on his island, hoping that our torch doesn't get extinguished along the way. We're not trying to just survive and get in by the skin of our teeth, which is kind of a weird saying. I have no idea what it means, but we're not just trying to make it in. No, he has said, you're in by his grace. The dispensation of the fullness of the times, that means at the end he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. It's ours, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He's chosen us in him. He's predestined us to be adopted as children. He's made us accepted. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us. He's revealed his mystery of his will to us. He's given us an inheritance, and he will gather us to himself. This is what the Christian has. So the question is, is this your I am? Is this your position? Is this your identity? Well, the question then follows, how could I be sure that it is? I don't know anybody that doesn't want that to be their identity. How could I be sure that it is? Well, look at verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 1. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed... You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Is this your I am? How can it be? Simply put, as Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writes it here, it comes by trust and belief in Christ. Your I am, your identity, your position in Christ is according to his grace by your faith, your trust, your confidence in him, not your activity. And if today you have put your faith in Christ Jesus for your salvation, the good news of salvation, that's what the gospel of salvation is there in verse 12 or 13. If you've put your confidence in that, not in your own I am, not in that you're a self-made man or woman, not in that you're going to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and, and not in your own self-realization or self actualization or whatever, not in any of those things, but if your identity is firmly in the fact that you've put your confidence and trust in him and in no other thing, then all of these things are yours. Not waiting for the check to clear, not hoping that the escrow account doesn't get depleted along the way, or that the stock market doesn't fall and you lose it all. No, if you've put your trust in him, then this is your identity. This is who you are. This is what defines every aspect of your life. And as I said earlier, this is more compelling and more coherent than anything that the world has to offer. Any of the empty philosophies of the world. So if this is your identity, if this is your I am, then what? Well, one more verse in Ephesians. Jump over to chapter 2. Right after Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2 who we were, that's what we're going to look at next week, our origin, who we were, and then he talks about the grace of God abounding to us, and then he says this, after we've received grace and been transformed from what we were to what we are now, he says this, verse 10, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Those are words of identity. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in. You are not in Christ because of your good works. You do not have the identity of saint because of your activity, but because you have the identity as a saint in Christ, therefore, you have new activities, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. 
It, it doesn't immediately follow that you will walk in them. You actually have to take a step to walk in them. Make a decision. I'm going to walk in this. And this is different than most people. See, most people will say, I should serve at church and I should give at church and I should go on a mission trip and I should read my Bible because that will make me more holy. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. You are holy already. And therefore, as the holy people of God, if you're a Christian today, if that's your identity, therefore, yeah, you should read the scriptures, worship God, give, serve, go on trip, whatever it may be. Do all of those things as an expression of who you are. That's who we are. If you're in Christ, you're in Christ for a purpose. You have been placed in him for good works. Now, if you would look on the back of your sheet there, point number five, just by the way, this is for you just to think about this week. I am what? Fill in the blank. I am what? What? But on the back of this sheet, at the top of it, you see Uncle Sam. We want you. Servant Sunday. In the back of the sanctuary today, and also in the lobby, and also at the connection point, which is under the cover because we got some rain today, there are these seven cards. Seven cards back in the back table in the sanctuary there. There's some in the lobby, out of the connection point, lots of them. And they're also there on that little sheet of paper, little rainbow of colors. We're reclaiming the rainbow. God created it. So here's the thing. We we need you to be a part of the work of God. You're a saint. If you're a Christian today, you put your faith in Christ. If you haven't, do that right now. Put your trust and confidence in him, not in yourself, to save yourself. He has the good news of salvation. But if you're a Christian today, you've been a part of this church for any length of time, we want you to step out and move into the good works that you should do, that God created beforehand, that you should walk in them. And we have some areas of service that we need your help in on Sunday mornings. We need about 120 new servants. There's a lot of you that already serve. If you want to serve in a new place, that's great. But if you don't serve, you need to get involved. And we we need a refresh team. What's a refresh team? Well, they make this place look good in between the services. Make sure that there's towels in the bathrooms and toilet, because nobody likes to go into a bathroom when there's no toilet paper. Not a good thing, right? You you can help fix that. (laughs) Or the parking team. We don't have a parking team, but we want one. This is the group of people that out in the parking lot, they direct traffic and they wave, they say hi. They welcome new people as they come to the church. A greeting team. These are the people who stand out in the patio area and when they see someone who comes on campus looking lost and every one of you came here one point looking lost and no one has a clue where the bathrooms are because we hid them. Uh, Well, they didn't mean to, but it was an accident. Um, And so... As a result, you know, you can direct people. They go, I don't know where I'm going. You go, hey, can I help you find the children's ministry? Where to check in your kids? Or you, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for the bathroom. Oh, well, here, let me show you where that's at. You don't need to walk them to the stall, but you can show them where it's at. <laughs> hospitality team. Everybody loves coming to church to get a donut when they come to church. And the hospitality team, Delana Martin and her team do a great job. We need more people to help serve at the hospitality table. I mean, my son, Ethan, his favorite thing to come to church for is to see Rich and Sally Wall and get a donut. Connection point. These are the people that stand out of the connection point when someone needs help here at the church finding out what's going on and how to get plugged in. They, they help with that. Security team. Maybe you don't have a happy face and you can't be a greeter, but you can be a security team <laughs> member. The usher team. These are the guys, the gals who serve in here in the sanctuary, helping people find a seat, receive the offering, passed out communion. These are just seven areas. There's lots of other ones, but these are seven of the areas that we need the, the most work. Uh, seven is the number of completions, so come on and help us fill this today. Before you leave, grab a card, sign up, leave it at the connection point. You can put your name, your phone number, your email address, circle of service that you can serve at. Leave this with Pastor Mark or the people at the connection point, and we'll be in touch with you this next week. But we want you to step into what God has for you. And here's the thing. You will never grow to maturity in Christ until you start exercising your faith and faithfulness. You will never grow to maturity in Christ until you start exercising your faith through faithfulness. But as you do, you will grow. And everyone who's made that step, they know that that's the case. And so before you go today, help us out. Plug in. Be a part of it. Because God has great things that he wants to accomplish, exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That's what he wants to do. And it's our desire that in 2015, we would grow in maturity and grace and service and faithfulness so that if God were to write his letter to Cross Connection, he would say to us, to the saints that are in North County who are faithful in Christ Jesus. 
May it be that that's the testimony of us as his people here in this place. Amen? Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Our worship team is going to come and lead us in another song of praise to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your great grace. God, we thank you that our position, our identity in you is not according to our activity, but it's according to your grace, which you've poured out upon us, as we'll see next week when we were totally undeserving, without strength, you gave it to us. And so, Lord, as we think on this week and over the next five weeks following it, as we think about who we are and who we were and who we will be and who we should be right now and who we can be by your grace and how we are to strive to be those things, Lord, transform us and set us on a a different path for your glory this year, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.